we are reading rich dad poor dad by robert t koyosaki we are on lesson 4 chapter 5 page number 121 of the book and 86 of the pdf chapter 4 lesson 4 the history of taxes and the power of corporations my rich dad just played the game smart and he did it through corporations the biggest secret of the rich i remember in school being told the story of robin hood and his merry men my teacher thought it was a wonderful story of a romantic hero who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor my rich dad did not see robin hood as a hero he called robin hood a crook robin hood may be long gone but his followers live on i often still hear people say why don't the rich pay for it or the rich should pay more in taxes and give it to the poor it is this robin hood fantasy or taking from the rich to give to the poor that has caused the most pain for the poor and the middle class The reason the middle class is so heavily taxed is because of the Robin Hood ideal. The reality is that the rich are not taxed; it's the middle class, especially the educated upper mid income middle class, who pays for the poor. So, what is this implying, right? If you want to take from the rich, the people who are working hard to achieve something, and give it to someone who is not doing anything. you are making the poor or that person who you are giving the dole to i mean become totally dependent on that dole okay this is a fact in the U uk if you are a citizen then the and you do not have a job or you are disabled in any kind of way the government is going to provide you housing and they are going to give you a monthly stipend okay in that stipend let me tell you is included a budget for entertainment also so the fact becomes that today a person need not work he just needs to say that i am not working i don't have a job or i can't work and his all his needs will get taken care of by the government right now i know of certain people who are registered in three boroughs and they are getting the dole and the house from three different boroughs and in two of the houses they are letting it out and earning more money so in fact they are getting they are earning more money by being unemployed than they would earn by being employed now why do you think that guy is ever going to work he is never going to work okay so now this is a big problem so that is why this gentleman he calls robin hood hood a crook right now robin hood of course used to uh, steal from the corrupt people that's a separate issue but the fact of the matter is if someone is working hard and you take from him and give it to the other guy slowly the guy who's working hard will stop working hard and then there'll be no revenue no income anything in the uh, society so taking from the rich to give to the poor is a bad idea the better idea is to enhance and educate and uh, Yeah, I mean, empower the people who are poor so that they can be more productive and do certain things. Again, to understand fully how things happen, we need to look at the history of taxes. Although my highly educated dad was an expert on the history of education, my rich dad fashioned himself as an expert on the history of taxes. Rich dad explained to Mike and me that originally in England and America there were no taxes. Occasionally there were temporary taxes levied in order to pay for wars. The king or the president would put the word out and ask everyone to chip in. Taxes were levied in Britain for the first for the fight against Napoleon from 1799 to 1816. and in america to pay for the civil war from 1861 to 
In 1874, England made income tax a permanent levy on its citizens. In 1913, an income tax became permanent in the United States with the adoption of the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. At one time, Americans were anti-tax. It had been the tax on tea that led to the famous Tea Party in Boston Harbor, an incident that helped ignite the Revolutionary War. It took approximately 50 years in both England and the United States to sell the idea of a regular income tax. What these historical dates fail to reveal is that both of these taxes were initially levied against only the rich. It was this point that Rich Dad wanted Mike and me to understand. He explained that the idea of taxes was made popular and accepted by the majority by telling the poor and the middle class that taxes were created only to punish the rich. This is how the masses voted for the law and it became constitutionally legal. Although it was intended to punish the rich, in reality, it wound up punishing the very people who voted for it, the poor and the middle class. Once government got a taste of money, its appetite grew, said Rich Dad. Your dad and I are exactly opposite. He's a government bureaucrat and I'm a capitalist. We get paid and our success is measured on opposite behaviors. He gets paid to spend money and hire people. The more he spends and the more people he hires, the larger his organization becomes. In the government, a large organization is a respected organization. On the other hand, within my organization, the fewer people I hire and the less money I spend, the more I am respected by my investors. That's why I don't like government people. They have different objectives than most business people. As the government grows, more and more tax dollars are needed to support it. So what is he saying? That today, even in India, if you see, the bureaucracy is so humongous and the amount of money that we pay to the bureaucracy, in, at times, it is more expensive to collect the tax than the tax that they receive, right? So this is exactly what he's saying over here, that today, the bigger your department, the more prestige you have in the government. But then to run that bigger department, you need to tax the people more. So there has to be some kind of a via media which allows for a balance to be created. It's useless to spend money to collect something which is less than what you are actually spending. That becomes a problematic thing. Like these raids, etc. they used to have previously, most of the time they used to recover less than the cost of performing the raid because people had to be bought from all over the place. They were raiding people uh, in multiple locations and there's a huge cost to doing that now if the recovery is less than what the cost was then what was the point of doing it so that this thing begs to be questioned that whether the government is actually doing something productive or not my educated dad sincerely believed that government should help people he loved John F. Kennedy and especially the idea of the Peace Corps. He loved the idea so much that both he and my mom worked for the Peace Corps, training volunteers to go to Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines. He always tried for additional grants and budget increases so he could hire more people, both in his job with the education department and in the Peace Corps. From the time I was about 10 years old, I would hear from my rich dad that government workers were a pack of lazy thieves. And from my poor dad, I would hear how the rich were greedy crooks who should be made to pay more taxes. Both sides had valid points. It was difficult to go to work for one of the biggest capitalists in town and come home to a father who was a prominent government leader. It was not easy to know which dad to believe.
My rich dad did not see Robin Hood as a hero. He called Robin Hood a crook. Yet, when you study the history of taxes, an interesting perspective emerges. As I said, the passage of taxes was only possible because the masses believed in the Robin Hood theory of economies. Take from the rich and give it to everyone else. The problem was that the government's appetite for money was so great that taxes soon need to be levied on the middle class. And from there, it kept trickling down. However, the rich saw an opportunity because they don't play by the same set of rules. The rich knew about corporations, which became popular in the days of sailing ships. The rich created the corporation as a vehicle to limit their risk to the assets of each voyage. The rich put their money into a corporation to finance the voyage. The corporation would then hire a crew to sail to the new world to look for treasure. If the ship was lost, the crew lost their lives, but the loss to the rich would be limited only to the money they invested for that particular voyage. <laughs> the diagram that follows shows how the corporate structure sits outside your personal income statement and balance sheet. So, what is happening? The your asset is the corporation, right? Now you are putting an asset or you are investing money into the corporation. If the corporation has income, it gets takes care of the expenses and then it becomes income. Now, because the corporation is there, you are able to debit all or many of your expenses into the corporation. So now what is happening? You are not paying for whatever you are using, using tax paid money. You are basically debiting the expenses in the corporation. So if the corporation has an income, the expenses are automatically debited and then the balance becomes income. Okay. But if you are, if you are running your personal income, then whatever salary, et cetera, you're getting is coming into your income and you are paying taxes on that income and then the expenses are taken off. So you're paying for your expenses with tax paid money. So now let's say the taxation is 30%. If you are earning 100 rupees, you actually have only 70 rupees as your real income and you are making the expenses out of that. Whereas if you have a corporation, you are debiting your expenses in the corporation Whatever income the corporation has, the expenses debited from that, and then you are paying the taxes. And that income then comes back to you. So you are, you are paying for expenses with tax unpaid money rather than tax paid money. It is the knowledge of the legal corporate structure that really gives the rich a vast advantage over the poor and the middle class. Having two fathers teaching me, one a socialist and other a capitalist, I quickly began to realize that the philosophy of the capitalist made more financial sense to me. It seemed to me that the socialists ultimately penalize themselves due to their lack of financial education. No matter what the take from the rich crowd came up with, the rich always found a way to outsmart them. That is how taxes were eventually levied on the middle class. The rich outsmarted the intellectuals slowly because they understood the power of money, a subject not taught in school. How did the rich outsmart the intellectuals? Once the take from the rich tax was passed, cash started flowing into government or coppers. Initially, people were happy. Money was handed out to government workers and the rich. It went to government workers in the forms of jobs and pensions, and it went to the rich via that their factories receiving government contracts. 
the government received a large pool of money, but the problem was the fiscal management of that money. The government ideal is to avoid having excess money. If you fail to spend your allotted funds, you risk losing it in the next budget. You would certainly not be recognized for being efficient. Business people, on the other hand, are rewarded for having excess money and are applauded for their efficiency. As so, this so what is happening now? The point here becomes that the basic point is that if you don't spend the money, however inefficiently, if you are in a government department, you are, I mean, you're not doing a good job, right? If you don't spend the money. In a business environment, if you spend the money in an inefficient manner, then you are penalized, right? So over there, it's all a matter of budgets. Over here, it's a matter of profits. So there's a big difference in the mindset of how both these uh, people are operating. As the cycle of growing government spending continued, the demand for money increased and the tax the rich idea was adjusted to include lower income levels, down to the very people who voted it in, the poor and the middle class. True capitalists use their financial knowledge to simply, simply find an escape. They headed back to the protection of a corporation but what many people who have never formed a corporation don't know is that a corporation is not really a thing. A corporation is merely a file folder with some legal documents in it, sitting in some attorney's office and registered with a state government's agency. It's not a big building or a factory or a group of people. A corporation is merely a legal document that creates a legal body without a soul. Using it, the wealth of the rich was once again protected. It was popular because the income tax rate of a corporation is less than the individual income tax rates. In addition, certain expenses could be paid by a corporation with pre-tax dollars. So in the beginning, what used to happen, the corporation was actually, the corporate tax was actually lower than the personal income tax. So naturally, if you kept your money in the corporation and didn't bring it into your personal accounts as income, then you were taxed less. So that means you had so much more money because otherwise the taxes take away a lot of money. Of course, this is now being equalized because the at least in India, the corporate tax is higher or at the highest slab of the individual income tax. So that parity has now started to come in. Uh, but the fact is that in a corporation, you can still debit certain expenses, which otherwise you would have to pay in your personal account with tax paid money rather than tax before tax money. This war between the haves and the have-nots has raged for hundreds of years. The battle is waged whenever and wherever laws are made, and it will go on forever. The problem is that the people who lose are the uninformed, the ones who get up every day and diligently go to work and pay taxes. If they only understood the way the rich play the game, they could play it too then they would be on their way to their own financial independence. This is why I cringe every time I hear a parent advise their children to go to school so they can find a safe, secure job. An employee with a safe, secure job without financial aptitude has no escape. So you, it does not mean that if you have a job, you will be in trouble. The how you manage your money after being in a job is what the game is all about. So you may be in a job, but the idea, what we read in the previous chapters was that you need to start building your assets. So what is an asset? An asset is an income generating thing, right? So if, if something is generating income for you, it's an asset. If it is eating uh, uh, 
it is requiring money to feed it or to maintain it, then it's a liability. So as you build up your asset base, the target needs to be that you generate enough assets in your portfolio that all your living expenses are taken care of by the money generated from your assets and your job is the icing on the cake. So it's not wrong to have a job, but when you get the money of salary from the job, what you do with the money, that is what is most important. Are you creating liabilities or are you creating assets? That is the game that we need to really play. Average Americans today work four to five months for the government just to cover their taxes. In my opinion, that is simply too long. The harder you work, the more you pay the government. That is why I believe that the idea of take from the rich backfired on the very people who voted it in. So what does he mean over here? If you, if you are in a higher tra tax bracket, then you pay more taxes, right? So the higher you go in your income, the more taxes you land up pay. So the harder you work, the more taxes you pay. So it's unintelligent. I mean, it's not intelligent way to do things. Every time people try to punish the rich, the rich don't simply comply. They react. They have the money, power and intent to change things. They don't just sit there and voluntarily pay more taxes. Instead, they search for ways to minimize their tax burden. They hire smart attorneys and accountants and persuade politicians to change laws or create legal loopholes. They use their resources to effect change. So what is happening? The rich will find a way so that they can pay less taxes. Because taxes is like 30% or 40%. Ultimately, it becomes a very big chunk of your money, right? So what he says that an average American is working for five to six months a year just to pay taxes. What does he mean? Now, if taxes are 50% or 40%, then for four or five or six months of a year, whatever you are working, you are actually working for the government because you are paying that entire amount in tax. The tax code of the United States also allows other ways to reduce taxes. Most of these vehicles are available to anyone, but it is the rich who find them because they are minding their own business. For example, 1031 is jargon for section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, which allows a seller to delay paying taxes on a piece of real estate that is sold for a capital gain through an exchange for a more expensive piece of real estate. Real estate is one investment vehicle that has a great tax advantage. As long as you keep trading up in value, you will not be taxed on the gains until you liquidate. People who don't take advantage of these legal tax savings are missing a great opportunity to build their asset columns. So, what is he meaning over here, right? Now, you have a property. You sell the property, you'll get a capital gain. Now, instead of using the capital gain and paying the tax, the idea would be to buy a bigger property. So, any gain that you get, if you are putting it into another property, then that amount is not taxed. It remains as an asset in your asset column. Provided, again, it's an income-generating asset, right? So, you are you buy the asset and you say, let's say you put it on rent. Now you start generating income from that. Once you sell that one, then you go into a bigger property or you invest in one more property, right? So like that, if you keep upgrading your properties, you will find that your asset column will grow, grow because you're not paying the taxes. So you are keeping the uh, rise in the value of your property with you rather than paying the taxes. The poor and middle class don't have the same resources. They sit there and let the government's needles enter their arm and allow the blood donation to begin. Today, I am constantly shocked 
at the number of people who pay more taxes or take fewer deductions simply because they are afraid of the government. I have friends who have had their businesses shut down and destroyed only to find out it was a mistake on the part of the government. I realize all that, but the price of working from January to May is a high price to pay for that intimidation. My poor dad never fought back. My rich dad didn't either. He just played the game smarter and he did it through the corporations, the biggest secret of the rich. You may remember the first lesson I learned from my rich dad. I was a little boy of nine who had to sit and wait for him to, to choose to talk to me. I sat in his office waiting for him to get to me. He was ignoring me on purpose. He wanted me to recognize his power and to desire to have that power for myself one day. During all the years I studied and learned from him, he always reminded me that knowledge is power. And with money comes great power that requires the right knowledge to keep it and make it multiply. Without that knowledge, the world pushes you around. Rich Dad constantly reminded Mike and me that the biggest bully was not the boss or the supervisor, but the tax man. The tax man will always take more if you let him. The first lesson of having money work for you, as opposed to you working for money, is all about power. If you work for money, you give the power to your employer. If money works for you, you keep the power and control it. So what, what is he saying here? There are two ultimate reality, realities, they say, taxes and death, right? Taxes will always be there. Whatever you do, there'll be a tax. Today, I think there are in, in India itself, there are about 13 or 14 taxes that we have to pay on, maybe more also, depending on what you have. Now, of course, GST and all that, they are combining and all that. So you've got GST, you've got corporation tax, you've got professional tax, you've got property tax, you've got urban land tax, you have uh, uh, wealth tax, uh, and add a few more taxes, right? So the point is that taxes will always be there. How you manage your tax system, that becomes very, very important. Now, if you are working and you're allowing the tax guy to take, then you're working for the tax man. But if you find the loopholes, you find the investment opportunities to build your capital base or build your assets, right, which is income generating, then you can beat that. Uh, I mean, you can manage the money and you can become financially independent. That's what the game is all about at the end of the day, to become financially independent. And when will you be financially independent? When your assets are generating enough resources for you to live by without working. So the question that he asked in the previous chapters, how many months can you live or how many years can you live if you stop working right now? That is what denotes how wealthy you are. Once we had this knowledge of the power of money working for us, he wanted us to be financially smart and not let anyone or anything push us around. If you're ignorant, it's easy to be bullied. If you know what you're talking about, you having a fight, you have a fighting chance. That is why he paid so much for smart tax accountants and attorneys. It was less expensive to pay them than to pay the government. His best lesson to me was, be smart and you won't be pushed around as much. He knew the law because he was a law-abiding citizen and because it was expensive to not know the law. If you know you're right, you're not afraid of fighting back. Even if you are taking on Robin Hood and his band of merry men. My highly educated dad always encouraged me to land a good job with a strong corporation. He spoke of the virtues of working your way up the corporate ladder. He didn't understand that 
by relying solely on a paycheck from a corporate employer, I would be a docile cow ready for milking. When I told my rich dad of my father's advice, he only chuckled. Why not own the ladder was all he said. So the point became becomes that what he said in the last paragraph, right? To be able to circumvent the law, to be able to manage the law, you have to know the law, right? So that becomes important. And since the rich people have the ability to pay accountants and lawyers to understand what needs to be done and how they can save the money, they land up saving the money. And this one, instead of climbing the corporate ladder, ultimately, why not own the ladder? What's the point of climbing the ladder when you can have the full ladder? As a young boy, I did not understand what rich dad meant by owning my own corporation. It was an idea that seemed impossible and intimidating. Although I was excited by the idea, my inexperience wouldn't let me envision the possibility that grown-ups would someday work for a company I would own. The point is that, if not for my rich dad, I would have probably followed my educated dad's advice. It was merely the occasional reminder of my rich dad that kept the idea of owning my own corporation alive and kept me on a different path. By the time I was 15 or 16, I knew I wasn't going to continue down the path my educated dad recommended. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was determined not to head in the direction most of my classmates were heading. That decision changed my life. Each dollar in my asset column was a great employee, working hard to make more employees and buy the boss a new Porsche. It was not until my mid-twenties that my rich dad's advice began to make more sense to me. I was just out of the Marine Corps and working for Xerox. I was making a lot of money, but every time I looked at my paycheck, I was disappointed. The deductions were so large and the more I worked, the greater they became. As I became more successful, my bosses talked about promotions and raises. It was flattering, but I could hear my rich dad asking in my ear, who are you working for? Who are you making rich? In 1974, while still an employee for Xerox, I formed my first corporation and began minding my own business. There were already a few assets in my asset column, but now I was determined to focus on making it bigger. Those paychecks with all the deductions made all the years of my rich dad's advice make total sense. I could see the future if I followed my educated dad's advice. Many employers feel that advising their workers to mind their own business is bad for business. But for me, focusing on my own business and developing assets made me a better employee because I now had a purpose. I came in early and worked diligently, amassing as much money as possible so I could invest in real estate. Hawaii was just set to boom and there were fortunes to be made. The more I realized that we were in the beginning stages of a boom, the more Xerox machines I sold. The more I sold, the more money I made. And of course, the more deductions came out of my paycheck. It was inspiring. I wanted out of the employee trap so badly that I worked even harder so I could invest more. By 1978, I was consistently one of the top five salespeople at the company. I badly wanted out of the rat race. In less than three years, I was making more in my real estate holding corporation than, than I was making at Xerox and the money I was making in my asset column in my own corporation was money working for me, not me pounding on doors, selling copiers. My rich dad's advice made much more sense. 
Soon the cash flow from my properties was so so strong that my company bought me my first Porsche. My fellow Xerox salespeople thought I was spending my commissions. I wasn't. I was investing my commissions in assets. So, so what does this imply, right? In the beginning, he was working more. He was earning more. But all the money that he had, right? That means he must have been very frugal in his expenses. And he was investing it into assets which were income generating. And soon, the assets were generating enough money to buy the luxuries that he wanted. So what happens? Now, the more you put into your asset column, the more revenues you start to generate. So it is very important to keep an open eye, you know, that we need to mind our business. When we are investing in something, this concept of whether it's an asset or a liability becomes very, very important. My money was working hard to make more money. Each dollar in my asset column was a great employee, working hard to make more employees and buy the boss a new Porsche with before tax dollars. I began to work harder for Xerox. The plan was working and my Porsche was the proof. By using the lessons I learned from my rich dad, I was able to get out of the proverbial rat race at an early age. It was made possible because of the strong financial knowledge I had acquired through rich dad's lessons. Without this financial knowledge, which I call financial intelligence or financial IQ, my road to financial independence would have been much more difficult. I now teach others in the hope that I may share my knowledge with them. I remind people that financial IQ is made up of knowledge from four broad areas of expertise. Number one, accounting. Accounting is financial literacy or the ability to read numbers. This is a vital skill if you want to build an empire. The more money you are responsible for, the more accuracy is required or the house comes tumbling down. This is the left brain side or the details. Financial literacy is the ability to read and understand financial statements, which allows you to identify the strengths and weaknesses of any business. So what is this? Basically, hisab, right? It's like the parta system. And any housewife, if she is competently managing her affairs of the house, will have a certain amount of accounting knowledge, provided she is doing it diligently and knows what her income and what her expenses are and what she is saving, right? It starts right from there, to be frank with you. Number two, investing. Investing is the science of money making money. This involves strategies and formulas which use the creative right brain side. So what he's saying here is investing is a lot dependent on intuition also. That gut feel, that making the right investment at the right time, right? Pulling out at the right time and then putting it back at the right time. Three, understanding markets. Understanding markets is the science of supply and demand you need to know the technical aspects of the market, which are emotion driven, in addition to the fundamental or economic aspects of an investment. Does an investment make sense or does it not make sense based on current market conditions? Number four, the law. A corporation wrapped around the technical skills of accounting Investing and markets can contribute to explosive growth. A person who understands the tax advantages and protections provided by a corporation can get rich so much faster than someone who is an employee or a small business sole proprietor. It's like the difference between someone walking and someone flying. The difference is profound when it comes to long-term wealth. So basically, in the corporation, 
there are many people working for you whereas a sole proprietorship you are working yourself so there's only so much that you can actually do yes binaka hi nikki i yeah. just wanted to ask you um, under the third point understanding markets where they yeah. mention you need to know the technical aspects of the market which are emotion driven in addition to the fundamental or economic aspects of an investment can you just elaborate or explain so that so what does this mean right today yeah. most markets are emotionally driven fundamental aspects are there technical aspect aspects are there but ye ye jo hota hai na ki ye mere ko acha lag raha hai you know many times you'll hear people saying that ye stock mere ko acha lag raha hai or you may have an emotional connect with a certain sector right a, a sentiment can wave through the entire uh, population let us say some uh, jaise swadeshi bol for example swadeshi right now there's a swadeshi movement which is emotional in nature it has no technical aspect to it and then everyone starts investing in companies which are making swadeshi stuff are you getting what i'm saying yeah so ultimately see at the end of the day there is something called eq there is iq and then there is eq suppose you have you are interviewing 10 people for a particular position right out of that three people are technically equally qualified who are you going to hire you tell me who are you going to hire they are equally qualified they are equally qualified who are you going to hire I think someone you have a connection with. So now that is where emotion comes in, right? Yeah. So whoever you feel, right? The technical word is you feel is good. Yeah. You will hire that person. So that is where the emotional aspect of entire thing comes in, right? So you have to feel the pulse. You have to feel the pulse of the market. Apart from the technical aspects, the pulse also needs to be felt. Okay. What are the emotions behind? what is happening that becomes very very important thank you tax advantages a corporation can do many things that an employee cannot like pay expenses before paying taxes that is a whole area of expertise that is very exciting employees earn and get taxed and they try to live on what is left a corporation earns spends everything it can and is taxed on anything that is left it's one of the biggest legal tax loopholes that the rich use they are easy to set up and are not expensive if you own investments that are producing good cash flow for example by owning your own corporation your vacations can be board meetings in hawaii car payments insurance repairs and health club memberships are company expenses most restaurant meals are partial expenses and on and on but it's done legally with pre tax dollars so have you all got that you are not spending tax paid money for many of your expenses so if you own a corporation or you have set up a certain tax structure where you pay the expenses and then on the balance you are taxed so let us say you are earning 100 rupees your expenses are 50 rupees then you spend that 50 rupees and then you are taxed on 50 rupees let's say the tax rate is 40% or let's say 10% or yeah okay 50% for low for calculation so you are going to pay 25 rupees as tax now if you are not a, running a corporation you earn 100 rupees 50% is the tax rate you are paying 50% taxes and then you are using up 50 rupees for your expenses so now you are left with zero whereas in the other case in the first case you are left with 25 rupees in your kitty so now who is going to become rich the guy who is paying pre post tax using post tax money for expenses or who is using pre tax money for expenses so basically that is the game that you need to start play protection from lawsuits we live in a litigious society everybody wants a piece of your action the rich hide much of their wealth using vehicles such as corporations and trusts 
to protect their assets from creditors. When someone sues a wealthy individual, they are often met with layers of legal protection and often find that the wealthy person actually owns nothing. They control everything but own nothing. The poor and middle class try to own everything and lose it to the government or to fellow citizens who like to sue the rich. They learned it from the Robin Hood story. Take from the rich and give it to the poor. So, at the end of the day, it is a matter of control, right? Now, if you, there is a mishap, if there is a market collapse, if you own something, then the person can take you out from it, right? Now, let us say all your assets are in a company or they are all in a trust. Now, how can they take it out? They cannot take it out from that company or that particular trust. But, so, in, in America, at least, most of the rich people, they have got trusts. So, all the money they have put in the trust, the trust owns the company, right? And whatever income is generated, the trust pays for the expenses of the, of the person concerned. But a lot of their expenses are debited in the corporation. So, they create layers and layers so that you can't get to their money in case there's a bad time. Of course, now again, these things are also being wrapped up, at least in India, till now the ultimate beneficiary of the trust and all that was not being declared. Now, everyone, every company also has to declare who is the ultimate beneficiary. The trusts have to declare who is the ultimate beneficiary. That all has to be put in black and white. Previously, that was not required. So, you could be... Uh, you could be a beneficiary of a trust or owning a huge company with just a very minimal share, right? Because it's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of companies. So that's how people used to manage. But now things are getting a little more tight because they are tightening the screws and tagging everything and other things. <clears throat> it is not the purpose of this book to go into the specifics of owning a corporation. But I will say that if you own any kind of legitimate assets, I would consider finding out more about the benefits and protection offered by a corporation as soon as possible. There are many books written on the subject that will detail the benefits and even walk you through the steps necessary to set up a corporation. Garrett Sutton's books on corporations provide wonderful insight into the power of personal corporations. Financial IQ is actually the synergy of many skills and talents. I would say it is the combination of the four technical skills listed above that make up basic financial intelligence. If you aspire to great wealth, it is the combination of these skills that will greatly amplify your financial intelligence. So what are the four, sorry. So what are the four skills? You need to know accounting. Hisab rakhna ana chahiye. You need to know how to keep your hisab. If you can't keep your hisab, then you will never be rich because you will not know what you're doing. You know what you're doing when you keep your accounts, you keep your hisab properly. Whatever you have, you need to keep investing the surplus. You, it should not sit in your almira doing nothing. You need to make it work for you. Right. You have to understand, right? You have to have a pulse of where to invest and how to invest. And the third and most important, you must know the law so that you can work around it. You can work within the law to your best advantage. So there are so many deductions that you can get from your income tax return. All those things you need to take up. What are depreciable assets, which are not depreciation? What can you debit as an expense in your accounts you need to know all this so that you can pay off expenses before tax so the next line which he's saying over here in sub summary in summary business owners with corporations number one earn employees who work for corporations earn Business owners spend, employees pay taxes. Business owners pay taxes, 
employees who work for corporations spend. As part of your overall financial strategy, I recommend that you learn about the protection that legal entities can provide for businesses and assets. So, there is a cost, there is definitely a cost of maintaining a corporation. Okay, so now you have to see your cost benefit ratios. Having said that, now it is even possible to make proprietary firms within your individual capacity where you can actually debit expenses before paying taxes. Having said that, a proprietor is still the entire liability. It is limitless liability if you're doing something under a proprietorship concern. But if you are invent, now the new uh, thing which has come about is uh, uh, LLPs, limited liability partnerships. Now, if you have a clear partnership, you your liability is still unlimited. But now you have a new entity in India, at least, which is called LLP, where your liability is limited to the amount you, that you have invested. Similarly, your liability in a corporation, in a, in, a, in a company, is limited to whatever you have subscribed to pay for your shares, right? So again, you have to really figure out what's the law and how does it work the best for you so that you can land up saving taxes because again i'm repeating taxes is one of the biggest expenses that you will have there was a calculation i think done that we literally land up paying anything between 50 to 60 percent taxes today anything that you buy you're paying 18 percent gst okay you're paying 30 percent or 33 or 35 percent income tax then you're paying property tax, you're paying wealth tax, you're paying urban land tax. Uh, I mean, there are so many tax, professional tax, right? So there are so many taxes that we are paying that literally speaking about 60% of our income directly goes into taxes. So the more taxes that you can save, the better off you are. And you need to know the law. And actually the fourth point know the law to be able to save taxes in a legal manner. I think we can stop here today.